ball for a few years, um, people like to hear from ball players. So they invite you to speak to places and give your testimony and do those kind of things. And when I came to Christ reading the Bobby Richardson story, um, I um, found in the back of the book a poem. It was called God's Hall of Fame. And um, I didn't pay much attention to it. It was a nice poem. Uh, had some good, good thoughts and things in there. Um, about a year after I came to Christ, uh, Bobby Richardson, who had played for the New York Yankees, and he, if you're a baseball fan at all, you may recall back in the 60s with Richardson at second and Quebec at short and Moose Gowan at first and Mickey Mantle and Whitey Ford and Yogi Berra and that whole crowd. And Bobby played second base on that team. And he came to Birmingham to speak at a banquet and uh, he gave his testimony, and at the end of his testimony, he shared this poem verbatim, just shared it with the group, and I just thought, wow, that was really impressive. And I thought, I'm going to start doing that. When I share my testimony, I'm going to start sharing that poem at the end. And I did, and sure enough, it, it, people were impressed. It, people wanted copies of the poem and all this stuff. And so um, I was invited to go speak to this um, church group up in uh, Gadsden, about an hour and a half drive from, from Birmingham. And um, so I went up, and they had a chapel full of people, and I was introduced and gave my testimony. And I got to the end of the testimony, and as I usually did, I introduced the poem. And I said, you know, there's a poem at the end of this Bobby Richardson story that I had read when I came to Christ, and it's just a really good poem. It's given me a lot of direction in life. And it goes like this. And God took his point back. I mean, he just took it. And I was a blank. Total blank. My wife's sitting about right there on the first row, and she knows the poem. She's heard it so many times. And she's trying to get me jump started. <laughs> and I never heard her. What I heard was God. And God was speaking to me with all the people like yourself just sitting there going... <laughs> And I'm sitting there for about an hour and a half, it felt like, um, trying to get this poem. And God says, you know what? That's my poem. And if you're going to use it for your glory, I'm taking it back. And I repented right there. I said, God, I, I get it. And uh, he says, you're not going to get it for another couple of minutes. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, finally he gave me the poem back and I shared the poem. That was a very traumatic experience for me. I never have forgotten it. If you're going to use it for your glory, I'm going to take it back. Um, there's a biblical principle in that, just about any gift that God gives us. And you know, the whole point of me sharing the poem was not that uh, people would be blessed, it was that I would be glorified. And so I began, God began to school me about pride and the opposite of pride, which is humility. I think every man's battle is, is pride. I mean, we, we have a prayer group, uh, prayer time every Friday morning before our men's group. And, and I remember one of our guys, a little Hispanic guy named Orlando, he's become a legend in our group. And uh, Orlando's praying, he says, and Lord, you know that, that I want to be humble before you, but I know I'm not much, but I'm all I think about. <laughs> it just cracked everybody up like it's cracking you up and uh, he's a legend for that one quote uh, and we all quote it all the time I ain't much but I'm all I think about <laughs> um, so let me read 1 Peter 5 5 through 9 it says, in the same way, you younger men, submit yourselves to the elders. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility and toward one another, because God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour, resist him, standing firm in the faith. 
you know, you're in this new man code and now all this ascending and all this making it and all this being successful and all this gathering the trappings of all that changes. God's not against nice things. God's just about us not promoting ourselves. When I was doing chapel services with the angels, there was a Father's Day. And since it was Father's Day, I took my 10-year-old, Chris, uh, to the park with me to do the chapel. And so I was giving my testimony that day to the angels. And um, there's a story with that, but I don't want to go there. Uh, after, the, after the chapel was over, they had several of the ball players' dads were at the, at the stadium with them for Father's Day, and they were introducing them out at home plate before the game. And Reggie Jackson uh, hung around the locker room, and we were talking, and he was talking about his dad and how his dad wasn't able to be there that day, and uh, he had had a hip operation. And I could tell he had a pretty close relationship with his dad. And, um, and then um, as Chris was there, and Chris is just sitting there with eyes that big. Um, and so when we were about to leave, Reggie, we walked by his locker, and he looked at Chris and says, you got to... Angel hat? And he went, no, sir. So he gave him a hat. And so uh, he said, you got tickets to the game? And we said, no, not really. Uh, he says, well, I got four seats right down on the first row of right field line. He says, I got a buddy sitting there. Here, here's two tickets. Go sit with him. And so we did. And Chris was going nuts. Chris is like his dad. He never misses an opportunity to promote himself. <laughs> and um, he... Um, he was just saying to everybody within 10 rows, this is Reggie's hat. This is Reggie's hat. And I'm just, you know, son. And um, so afterwards, uh, we were down on Bowball Island, and, and we were staying in a friend's house. He rents out down there. And, um, and we went to get this pizza joint. So we go to the pizza joint, and um, we get some pizza, and then we're walking around uh, Balboa Island. And I told Chris, I said, look, son, here's a proverb. Let other men praise you and not your own lips. You need to learn that. If you say one more word about that hat, I'm taking it back. <laughs> so we're walking down the street, and um, this lady comes walking out of a shop, and she sees his hat, and she kind of takes it off his head and says, hey, can I try your hat on? And she goes, yes, ma'am, it's Re Reggie Jackson's size. <laughs> <laughs> he was fancy footwork. We got to do that sometimes. I knew he was going to make something of himself right there. Reggie Jackson's size. So, you know, we don't have to be very old for we're struggling with this pride thing, do we? I mean, we all struggle with pride. We all struggle with ego. It just comes with our DNA. Again, we're hardwired with that. Now we got to come unwired. Now we're in the new kingdom. Now we've got a new man code. And we're living by a whole new system and set of values and rules and lifestyle. And now we've got to change all that ego, that promotion. Um, all that uh, getting ahead. Being first. Being most important. Being recognized. And everybody just says, you've got to get out there and you've got to get your name out there. And you've got to get this out there and that out. You've got to get on Twitter. You've got to get on Facebook. And you've got to get on... I'm on no book. Um, and... And even your pride and your humility, you can be proud about your humility if you're not careful. Um, you know, I'm, uh, I, uh, I've been there before too. Um, so, you know, the, um, the issue and in, in the things that we're dealing with, with man code and trying to get a handle on this new thing, it's almost like, we have spent so many years building up this persona, this outward thing that we want to present to people to give them the idea of who we are so that we're doing nice things inside and we can think terrible things. I mean, outside, but think terrible things inside. And that's okay because they can't read our thoughts. But God reads our thoughts and God knows the kind of person we really are. This is the reason living in the light is so important. This is the reason that not having anything to hide See, when you're a humble guy, you don't have anything to hide anymore. You don't have to shuck and jive. You can just let them think what they're going to think. You don't have to protect yourself. You don't have to explain yourself. They don't have to understand you. You're, you're fine with that. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, let your 
requests be made known to God in the peace of God. See, you have that peace of God. And if you never had the peace of God, I cannot begin to tell you what it's like, but if you've had it, you know what I mean. It's that peace of God that surpasses all comprehension. There's no reason to have peace. The outward circumstances say that you should have no peace. But you have peace. I remember we were in the church that I was pastoring. We met in Boys and Girls Club over in Irvine, and they got a new director. And this director um, called me in and said, hey, we'd been meeting there for several years, and he called me in, one of my elders, and said, I want to meet with you guys. So I went over to meet him, and I thought, well, he just wants to know the tenants. And uh, there are five Boys and Girls Clubs in that district. And... Um, and so we're sitting down, and he says, well, you know, the, I could tell he was nervous. And he said, I, I just wanted to share with you guys that uh, you're going to have to move out. And because um, I, I, as I'm looking at what we're going to do in the Boys and Girls Club and what we're going to do in the, the whole deal, it's just not room for you guys to be there. And, um, and he says, but I'm going to give you six months, which was better than the two weeks we got in the place we were before. Um, and so... You know, and I, said, and I could tell the guy was really nervous and thinking this might not be a fun meeting. And my job was to make that fun meeting. And so I told him, I said, well, you know what? It sounds like to me you're giving good leadership to the Boys and Girls Club and you're doing exactly what this club needs. Because we've been around a while and we see how this thing operates and some new blood in here is exactly what it needs and some good leadership. And he just kind of looked at me. And I said, and besides, God knows you know, where we're going to meet next. And he knows what, our, what the plan for our church is. And I'm sure he'll work that out. And we had a nice talk after that. And I could tell, you know, the, the air went out of his balloon. And he was feeling a lot better. And he had the peace that surpasses all understanding. And uh, so we're leaving. And he walks around the corner of his desk. And he says, well, you guys sure are being Christian about all this. <laughs> See, people don't expect Christian to be Christian. I mean, with the Christian church, he expected us to come in there. He expected us to be upset. He expected us to go, what do you mean? And, um, or not be happy. And so when we just be Christian, we just trust God. See, that's that life of peace and rest where you don't have to be fearful. You don't have to be afraid of what's happening next. You don't have to be afraid of what God's doing. And we've learned that all news is just news. It's not good news or it's not bad news. It's just news because it seems like all the stuff that we think is good news doesn't turn out to be such good news sometimes. And all the things we think are bad news, it's kind of like the guy that over in Russia and he's a peasant and, and uh, he gets a new horse. And he's telling his, his neighbor, he says, well, I got a new horse. Oh, that's good. He goes, well, it wasn't so red hot. He says, my son got on it and fell off and broke his leg. Oh, that's bad. Well, it wasn't that bad because the army came in and then they were taking all the able-bodied men to, to fight in the army and they didn't take him because he had a broken... Oh, that's good. Well, no, it's not so good. And so, you know, it just goes back and forth. And so all these things that look good turn out not to... You know, that God had a purpose in that. And... It's like the guy that was, that was talking to me about the lawsuit. And I said, I said, look here. That guy that you were going in business with, he just proved that he's not the guy you want to be in business with. If he would treat you like that. And so it seems to me God is delivering you from this situation and you're griping about it. He's delivering you from a, from a, a life of misery being linked together with this guy contractually at the hip. And God is just getting you out of it. And you're griping at him about it. This is where we have to learn to think spiritually. This is how we have to learn to be able to see those things that are invisible. Those things that are behind the scenes that God is doing. See, I may not always understand. And I, I may not always understand God's plan. But I know his heart. And because I know his heart, I know he's working behind all things. And he's getting things done that I could never understand. And never know he's putting into place. But they're just right there. And you know, sometimes we don't ever get right there. Because our righteousness is not where it needs to be. At the end of the prodigal son's message and story that Jesus told. And the prodigal son, and we all know the story. And we all know, know how, what a terrible Jewish boy this boy was. I mean, you couldn't paint a worse picture than he painted for all the, 
the Pharisees and the Jews that were listening to this. And of course, this boy had done several things that were worthy of being stoned to death. But the boy came to his senses in the pig pen, and he comes home, and the, and the dad throws a party for him. Runs down the road, kisses him, hugs him, puts the sandals on his feet, the robe on, the ring on, and says, kill the fatted calf. Because my boy was dead and now he's alive. He was lost and now he's found. And we're going to have a party. You know, the, in that same Luke 15 passage with the coin and the sheep and all the lost stuff going on there. You know, one of the things he says, all the angels in heaven rejoice when one man, re one man repents. One sinner repents. And you know why I think that is? Because it's so rare. It is. They're just looking for a chance. It's, oh, will he repent? Will he say, I'm sorry? Will he humble himself? Oh, shucks. He's not going to do it. They get a lot of aw shucks going on up there in heaven. But when one guy does, and humility is the most beautiful thing in the world. I, I tell you, you want to get my tears popping out of my eyes, just show me a scene in a movie where reconciliation is happening. In that fireproof movie, and that guy reconciles with her in the fire hall there, every time, I've seen it three or four times, I'm not going to cry this time, I'm not going to cry this time. But boy, when they start making up, I can't help it. There's something about humility, there's something about brokenness, there's something about that... Uh, emptying yourself, making yourself nothing. There's something about going to someone and asking forgiveness. It's about being a peacemaker. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. You want to reflect God? You want to reflect His image? You got to be a peacemaker. Not a troublemaker. Not a guy that's got contention and, and broken arguments all going on around him and I have guys to me, one of the most disappointing things I have from time to time is someone will come to me and say, I know that guy's pretty active in your ministry, but you ought to see how he treats people at work. You ought to see how he, when he gets his game face on at work, how he's a different guy because we guys are able to compartmentalize our lives. So we got our church over here, and I saw this in my dad's life. I didn't realize that's what I was seeing until later on, and then I realized what was going on. He's like so many other guys. But he had church life here, and he'd go to church and go to Sunday school and do his thing. He had the work at the line crew. He was Alabama Power Company, and he worked all over the state. And he had a line, nothing he loved better than the line crew. And we're going out and being with these guys and, and uh, just doing all the carousing and stuff that they did. And my dad was an alcoholic, and, but I never saw him drink at home. He was just home on weekends and going all week. And so I'm, you know, I'm not the adult child of an alcoholic for, as far as that syndrome goes, I don't think. But... Um, and I only saw him under the influence a couple of times before I grew up and left home when he started having even more trouble, though. And, um, but uh, I just saw my dad was one person here, and he was another person here, and then at home with us, he was this kind of person. I never heard him say, use profanity, but when I saw him a few times with his buddies, I could hear some profanity flying out of his mouth. And so I began to realize that we men are pretty good at that. We, we can be this guy here and this guy here and this guy here. And the challenge in the new man code is to be the same guy everywhere you are. It's to be God's man in every position, in every situation. You never forget who you are. Daniel lived for 80 years in a pagan culture and never compromised and never forgot who he was. Three times a day. And this is how he never forgot who he was. First, when he was a young boy, he purposed in his heart not to defile himself. And then as a man, three times a day, he would go to his windows, and the scripture says, which were turned toward Jerusalem. Why does it say that? Because he knew who he was. He wasn't confused about who he was. He was a Jew, living in a pagan culture. They had given him a pagan name. They could change him outside, but they could not change him inside. They could parade all kinds of gods around, but he knew who his God was. And he wasn't confused about that. And so a man needs to know who he is in Christ. He needs to establish his identity in Jesus Christ. And he doesn't need to be confused about it. And men today are confused about it. And men today haven't got that nailed down. Because there's a lot of options out there of who you can be. And what guru you're going to follow. And what persona you want to present to the world. And the persona you and I want to present to the world is to just to be real. But if you're not real in God's presence, you can't be real with the people. If you're not authentic before God, if you don't walk in the light as He is in the light, His light, His penetrating light, 
And you know, what sense does it make to run from God anyway? Just go read Psalm 139 again if you're a little fuzzy on that. In Psalm 139, he just basically says, where can I go from your presence? If I go to the heavens, you're, you're there. If I go to the deep, darkest sea, you're there. No matter where, if I turn out the lights, lights like darks, like light to you. When I go to sleep, I wake up and you're still there. So there's nowhere I can go to get from your presence. His, his, his gaze is penetrating. And he sees everything and knows everything. Before I even say it, you know it. Before words come out of my mouth. You had every day of my life planned before I was ever born. Well, golly, you're finding out this, this God's pretty unescapable. So why are we shucking and jiving with Him? Why are we running from Him? Men just run from We spend a lot of our time just avoiding God. One of the scariest things for a guy is to be left alone in God's presence. Why would that be? Why is a guy afraid to be in God's presence? Well, I know why it is because I was afraid. I was a missionary. For years, avoiding prayer meetings. And it used to really bother me. Why do, I, why do I not want to go to the prayer meeting? It was the same reason I was telling you before. I had a lot of guilt and shame. Even though I was a missionary, I wasn't living the perfect life. I was stumbling and fouling up like a lot of guys do, like most men do. And I didn't know where to go with that. I knew I could confess it and he would forgive it. But you know what my problem was? I asked guys all the time, I said... They'll come and they'll confess something to me. And I'll say, well, um, what do you think God thinks of that? I had this couple come to me. They wanted help in communication. And so I gave them a sign and I said, look, Andrew, why don't you read the Bible every night together, every night you can, be as consistent as you can. And read the Bible together and, um, and then pray. And so they came back three months later, and I said, well, how y'all doing? She said, Andrew's doing great. He's reading the Bible, and um, he's um, being very consistent with that. But while he's reading the Bible, she says, and, and she had some kind of ministry, and she traveled, and she says, I'm working on my itineraries, and I'm working on the computer, on the emails. I said, really? And I said, well, Andrew, what do you think of that? Andrew had a real man of God response. Andrew said, well, you know, I just pray that God would change your heart. That's a good response. I looked at her and I said, what do you think God thinks about you doing that? Guys, I always start with God. It doesn't matter what I think or you think. It matters what God thinks. People care what God thinks. People care about Jesus. People that don't care about church or religion care about Jesus and what He has to say. So rather than say, you know what my church says, don't say that. Say, so, you know what Jesus had to say about that? And they go, what? They're all ears. So I said to her, I said, well, what do you think God thinks of that? She says, I think he's disappointed in me. I said, well, I got good news. He's never been disappointed in you a day in your life. For God to be disappointed in you, he'd have to have this high standard that you were able to live all this stuff you say you believe. She had told me before about how, even though she's been very successful and had some real successful ministry and stuff, her parents have never been proud of her. They, they didn't want her in ministry. They didn't want her doing this stuff. And they've never given her their blessing. You know what? She doesn't think God has either. She don't think God's giving her his blessing. That's why it's so important for us and for our fathers and our sons we pass things along to them. So you're going to pass along what you have. You can't give them what you don't have. You are going to give them what you do have, whether it's good or bad. And, um, and so she had gotten from her parents and just subconsciously thinking that, that a similar thing happened to me. You know, my mom had a hero in life, and it was her oldest sister. She had four sisters. She was the youngest. The oldest sister was her hero. And her older sister had two sons, Joe and Don. And Joe and Don were the perfect kids. Um, and she made sure they were perfect. But, but they saved their money. They worked first, and then they saved their money. And they not only did that, they kept up with where they spent their money. They played ball. They excelled. They were ex took in class and academically, they excelled. Mom wanted 
Joe and Don. She got Bob and Pete. Bob and Pete were not Joe and Don. Bob and Pete were ball players, and that's all we cared about. We just lived for the next game, and we just made good enough grades to stay eligible, which sometimes we didn't. And um, she was always saying, well, Joe and Don, well, Joe and Don. And so I could, and I wasn't taking all this in. I wasn't realizing this growing up, but since I've reflected on it, trying to figure out what, you know, why, what's my problem, then, um, then I found out that this stuff was true. And what I found out was that, uh, well, just tell you one more part of that story. Uh, my mom was dying of cancer, and so I went back from here back to Alabama, and I was going to spend four or five days with her, and I let all the caregivers go that were taking care of her, and spent some time with her, and it was a great time, really, but there was just this one thing. The last thing I ever really remember her saying, I'm sure she said other things, but this is the, kind of the last thing I remember, is she was laying on the couch, and she had her back to me with her face toward the couch, and um, I was sitting in a chair right by the couch, and she was bemoaning the fact that she was spending $200 a day on these caregivers and she was going to run out of money and, you know. And I said, well, Mom, you know, you're not going to run out of money. God's going to take care of you. And she looked over her shoulder at me and she says, well, I'm glad he is because you sure can't help. And now, Mom was not in her right mind at that point, but she, again... Joe and Don would have been able to help her. They were, Joe, Joe turned out to be an insurance executive. I mean, sorry, aluminum company executive and uh, retired at 55 and was very successful. Joe went to Duke Medical School and became an ear, nose, and throat specialist and has done exceedingly well and just a great guy. And um, so if I was Joe and Don, I could have provided for her, but I was a missionary just scratching it out and wasn't able to help her financially. But which is not the point. The point is that I was standing out at a retreat one day about a year ago. And this was just one year ago. And I was at this retreat, and God had blessed a lot of ministry that I've had, and He's taught me a lot. And I don't doubt God's love for me, but I still had a problem, and I didn't know what it was. And so I went out, and at this retreat, we fasted. It was a four-day retreat, and we fasted the last day. We would started on Wednesday evening, and we were going to finish on Thursday evening with a banquet. And that day on Thursday, they sent us out, just like if they sent us out here. And they said, get out there, find yourself a place, draw a circle, and get in it. And you're going to stay there all day, just meditating on what we've been teaching you. And, you know, they gave us these four things to, to meditate on and to journal about. And, um, and just sit in that t and just see what God's got to say. And I went specifically to hear what God had to say. I said, God, I know I need a breakthrough. I know something needs to happen in my life. Um, but uh, I don't know what it is, and, and I'm getting tired of this. I'm, I'm about to point at my age. I need to know why I feel this way. Because I've helped a lot of guys get free, and I'm struggling with that same freedom myself. And... Um, so while I was out there, I was leaning up against this log and I was whittling on this long branch and stick, kind of walking stick kind of a thing and just talking and journaling. And, and, um, and it got, the sun kept going down and getting further and I'm going, okay. Uh, and then it kept going down and I was in my last hour. I'm sitting there leaning on this stick in the middle of this circle and I said, okay, God. I said, uh, you know, I got to go back for, for the banquet coming up. Uh, if you got anything to say, it'd probably be good good time. And um, and so I'm still just sitting there and sitting there, and all of a sudden, out of the blue, as he would, he says, "I don't understand why you think there's anything wrong with you. I like the way I made you. I like the guy you are." And I don't know if there's a gift of laughter, but I got it for five minutes. <laughs> I laughed. I just laughed. It was so out of the blue, so not what I was expecting from God. I expected God to say, well, you remember this? That's why I'm not blessing you. Remember this? That's why you're not as intimate with me as you want to be. And he didn't say anything like that. He gave me a vision one time of, um, in, in our, as I said, we met in the Boys and Girls Club in the gymnasium in our, in our church. And I had this vision one time of walking in and all the bleachers are up. And it's just big and empty except for about 10 people in a circle in the middle of the gym. And I walked in and so I walked over to see what they were doing. They were kicking somebody. It was on the floor. And so I joined in and started kicking. I looked around and 
And I uh, asked the guy, I said, well, who are we kicking? And I looked down, it was me. And Jesus says, you notice that I'm not in the circle. He says, but what you tend to do, Pete, is you tend to beat yourself up and self-loathe because you just can't seem to get where you think I want you to be. You just don't think you're ever measuring up. You think like, boy, you know, I'm here and God's over there. And he says, I'm tired of you doing that. I was up at Forest Home and we had this conference and we'd done what uh, we do in a lot of conferences where we anoint these men of God and, and stuff. And so we were driving back from that meeting and, and there's firefighters for Christ. And this guy was walking along the side of the road and I picked him up to go to the chow hall. And he said, yeah, I'll take a ride. And so uh, turns out he's a, a chief in a, in a fire department there in the L.A. area. And... Um, so we're walking over to the, to the chow hall, and we're in the, right in the middle of the road. And I put my arm over his shoulder, and I said, well, you came a fire chief, and you're leaving a man of God. And he says, well, I didn't take the anointing. And I said, really? He says, yeah, I didn't do it. And I said, uh, what is that? And he says, well, I just can't get to Jesus. He says, I, he's always over there, and I'm always over here, and I can't get to him. And boy, did I know what he's talking about. And I said, well, what if Jesus came and got you? See, that's what he did. He left his throne in heaven and he came to get us. And what if Jesus would come and get you? What if you would just wait and say, Lord, come and take me for yourself? What if he would do that? He said, that'd be great. I said, well, here he is right now and he wants to take you for himself. You want to ask him right into your heart? And the guy prayed to receive Christ right there in the middle of the street. We walked into the chow hall and it was full and everybody's eating. They have a little microphone up there where they can tell people, say prayers and tell people announcements. And, and, um, and so I said, well, why don't you tell him what you did? His wife was sitting at the table right there in front of the mic as God would have it. And he walked up and he shared what had happened and she just burst into tears. She had been praying for him for years. And so I realized in dealing with him that we just struggle getting where we need to be as men. We struggle with what God, our concept of God, we struggle with feeling like we're okay with him. And we don't know, know what to do with our sin because with sin we get more guilt and shame. And, and when you ask a guy, have you confessed that to God? And the guy will say, yeah, I have. Did he forgive you? Yeah, he did, because he knows his theology. He knows God says, if you'll confess your sin, I'll be faithful and righteous to forgive your sin. So he knows God forgives his sin. And then I'll ask him another question. I say, have you forgiven yourself? Because men have a hard time forgiving themselves. I said, so let me get this straight. You haven't forgiven yourself, but God has forgiven you. Who's really God here? I mean, who's most important here? You've made yourself more important than God. It's that old story of the older brother and the prodigal son. When the, when the father said, let's throw a party for this boy, the older son was out in the field. He comes walking in, sees all the commotion. He asks the servant, what's going on? Your brother was lost, but now he's found, and your dad's throwing him a party in there. And the brother wouldn't go in to the party. And the father came out and, and begged him, begged him, pleaded with him to come into the party. And the boy wouldn't come in. Now his problem was self-righteousness. His problem was, Dad, I've been faithful to you. I've obeyed you. I've done everything that you ever wanted me to do. You've never given me one little stinking goat to have a party with my friends. Well, it wasn't a friend's party. It was a family party that he was inviting him into. And this boy would rather have a party with his friends. Even though he worked for his dad, even though he did everything his dad told him to do, his righteousness did not succeed that of the scribes and the Pharisees. You'd think that Jesus was in that whole thing, that thing about the son being found, you'd think he would end it on an up note, but he ended it on a down note. But the boy, as far as we know, never went into the party. It seems like a lot of people work for the Father, serve the Father, 
But you know, there's a quote we talk about a lot just to try to keep ourselves straight. And the quote is, it must really grieve God's heart that so many men want to serve Him who won't take time to get to know Him. That boy worked for his father, but he didn't know his father. He didn't love his father. And he wouldn't come in and fellowship because he was indignant. He had righteous, self-righteous anger. And so he got cheated out of the party. Unless your righteousness exceeds that, or exceeds that, of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. You know how many people there are right now serving God who aren't going to get into the kingdom of heaven? You know how many people that think they're in the light, but they're really in the dark? And isn't that what Jesus said again in the Sermon on the Mount? No man's in the dark so deep as he who thinks he's in the light, but he's really in the dark. How many guys think they're in the light, but they're really in the dark? They know the songs. They know the liturgy. They've heard all the sermons. But they don't know the Father. And all they're missing is that intimate, personal relationship with a dad who's their Father in heaven. And guys, we don't want to live our whole lives missing that relationship with our Father in heaven. And as we are working out our man code, as we're figuring out what, um, what we are and who we are in our personas, is we're working through this whole thing of humbling ourselves and descending rather than ascending, of decreasing so He can increase in our lives. I'd say this is pretty important stuff. When I was sharing this with our guys not long ago, one of the guys just said, you know, this pride stuff's pretty important. When you start looking at the verse that we looked at to begin with in 1 Peter 5, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Well, if you just want to have a different color jersey on than God's got, just start being a prideful, arrogant guy. Be a guy that thinks you can do it yourself. Be a guy that says, you know what, I'm not real sure. And I was sharing the gospel with a young man that I was going to do he and his he and his fiance's wedding, and so I was having a little pre-wedding interview with them, and I, I was pretty sure that they didn't know the Lord, and, and um, so I shared the gospel with them about this side, that side, up, down, coming from every angle with a guy, and, and they, they were very courteous and listened, and, you know, and at the end I just said, um, well, would you like to give your heart to Christ? He says, no, not really, not right now. I said, I always like to find out why people are, are rejecting Christ category one. Um, and so wondering why that would be, he says, I'm just not so sure his plan's better than my plan. That's a scary thought. But um, I said, well, I'll, I'll just pray that God will give you every bit of your plan. They tell me, if you want to make God laugh, tell him what your plans are. <laughs> God opposes the proud. God gives grace to the humble. And so, men, as you and I journey on here, one of the things we want to do is to make sure that this thing we all struggle with, this thing that you're going to have to come to grips with every time you come into a relational issue, every time someone slaps you on one face, they humiliate you. They put you down. They're insensitive to your needs, your wants, or your feelings. You're going to have to find a way to die. To turn the other cheek. See, anybody can be slapped on the face. But to turn the other cheek, that's a different thing. Anybody can be hurt or disappointed. Anybody can be forced to go one mile. But see, when you go two miles and you volunteer to do that, because you legally had to go that one mile. You were forced to. That soldier, that Roman soldier, he could put his pack on your back. You had to carry it for a mile. But this guy had never had a guy volunteer to carry it to. Had never had a guy, as Jesus says, if you just love those who love you, what good is that? Even the Pharisees, even the tax gatherers are doing that. What makes you different from others? Jesus expects you and me to be different. But the only way we'll ever be different is if we start at that first beatitude, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn and weep. How are you doing with your sin? Are you a good candidate for turning from your wicked ways? Do you even know your wicked ways? And I'll close with this one. Guy, one of our young guys, young guys now in his 40s, 
um, to me anyway, come, came to me and said, my dad's going to divorce his wife. He's been married to her 20 years. I told him he had no biblical grounds. But he said he's going to do it anyway. And uh, I asked him if he'd talked to somebody before he did, and would you be willing to talk with him? I said, sure. So we got together, and, um, and I said, well, tell me about yourself. He says, well, I go to this church, and at that church I do this and that, and I serve in these ways. He says, I have a men's group I've been meeting with, a small group, and we've been meeting for years, and we meet on Tuesdays, and I go to CBMC on Thursdays. And um, I said, wow, you got a busy, busy spiritual calendar there. Tell me about your marriage. He says, uh, well, I've been married to this gal for a long time. She's, she comes from another country, and um, I've... Uh, she told me about five years ago that she wanted a divorce and so she was going to start a business. And as soon as she got where she could live on her own, she was going to go ahead and divorce me. And so she's been gone a lot and treating me terrible when she comes home a lot. And I'm just tired of it. I'm going to go ahead and divorce her. Now, I know my son says I have no biblical grounds, but uh, I'm going to do it anyway. And I said, well, that tells me a lot about you. He goes, really? What's it say? Well, it tells me that Jesus is not Lord of your life. And with all your busyness and all your going to meetings and all your serving at the church, Jesus is not Lord of your life. And the second thing he tells me is God's Word is not the final authority in your life. It's just a book of suggestions for you. Even though you hear sermons every week and you probably have quiet times here and there, God's Word is not your final authority. You haven't decided you're going to obey God's Word. And then at that point, you just got to be quiet and let the Lord do the work. And so it was probably 30 or 45 seconds and a tear started coming down his cheek. And he says, I can't believe I've gotten so far away and I didn't even realize it. That, that older son in the prodigal son story was, the younger son was lost out there in the sin and the sex, rock and roll and women. The older son was lost in the pew. Good boy, did everything right, followed all the rules. But he was lost sitting right there in the pew, maybe hearing the gospel every week. So guys, you know, your business and mine, as we struggle on this journey, it's not real complicated. It's not easy, but it's not complicated. Your job and mine is to be crucified with Christ so that we no longer live. Because if you're living, if that pride in you is living, you're never going to turn the other cheek. Nobody's ever going to come walking over to your locker and say, whatever you got, I need. You're never going to do that if you can't humble yourself under the mighty hand of God so He can exalt you. Nothing He'd rather do is exalt you in due time. The Word of the Lord.